Welcome to Creekside Online and to a new year. We are praying for you and your family that you will have a blessed 2021. Throughout the last several months, we found ourselves adapting to many challenges in life as a result of the pandemic. Parents have found themselves filling roles and carrying out tasks they never expected. With that in mind, we are pleased to present the Parenting in Coronaville workshop hosted by several top leaders in the industry. Our hope is that in the 60 minute workshop, along with notes, we'll provide some spiritual and practical advice to help parents better navigate the uncharted waters of this pandemic world. You can access the Parenting in Coronaville workshop on our kids page at creeksideeg.com forward slash kids. We also wanna let you know about one, our women's winter Bible study opportunities. We are offering three great study options to help you stay grounded in God's word over the coming months. More details and registration are available at creeksideeg.com forward slash women. Space is limited, so register now. Again, we are just so glad you have joined us today. If this is your first time watching, please text the word guest to 888-111. We would love to get to know you. If you would like to talk to someone or have someone pray with you, please text the words need prayer to 888-111 and someone will contact you. If you would like to give to the ministry here at Creekside, text the words give to the number on your screen. Right now, let's worship together.
you may find yourself this season, whether your life is really hard or whether life is easy, I hope that this verse can encourage you. This verse comes from chapter, it comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. With that, know that God is with you no matter what you're going through, he will go before you, he will protect you, and he'll be right beside you. Wherever you may feel your heart is trembling, there will be peace. Wherever you feel like there are waters that are gonna overtake you, God will calm those seas. Come on, let's continue to worship and let's sing about this.
everyone, guess what? It is 2021, 2020, 2020 is officially over. Remember when we thought 2020 was going to be the best year ever? Here at Creekside, we started off with a sermon series entitled Vision 2020. Lots of churches and organizations were really laying down groundwork for a new vision in the year of 2020. I mean, you had to, right? It was 2020, 2020 vision. Then there were all the holidays that were lining up perfectly. Valentine's Day, also known as the last holiday we celebrated inside of a full restaurant, was on a Friday. Fourth of July was on Saturday. Halloween, Saturday, Christmas, and New Year's Eve were going to kick us off into three-day weekends. Oh, and I can't forget my favorite. The reason I truly believe 2020 was going to be a magical year, Cinco de Mayo, was on Taco Tuesday. I mean, this was gonna be magical, a magical year, a year would, we never would forget, but then the 49ers lost the Super Bowl and it all fell apart. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna recap the year for you because I'm sure you all remember or trying to forget, but between a virus, an election, and, and racial tension, there were so many things that drove us apart. It felt like so much darkness, so many things that were causing chaos and division. So today we're going to take a one week break between our Christmas and exile series and our series on first Peter that Pastor Scott will start next week to remember that God brings light into dark places. He brings unity into chaos and division. He brings us into his perfect peace. In fact, that peace that came in the midst of chaos and division, it came in the midst of darkness. Light and peace came in the form of a man, a baby. But it didn't stop there. God's intent wasn't just to bring peace to the manger. His intent was to bring peace to our hearts. Just over a week ago, we celebrated Christmas the birth of Jesus, the light of the world. And when we think of Christmas, we think of really nice, sweet things. Silent nights, holy nights, all is calm, all is bright. We think of joy, love, hope, peace. Isaiah was a prophet to the people of God, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. He brings us this beautiful picture of the birth of the Messiah. Look in Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's heartwarming, right? First of all, who doesn't like the birth of a baby? You know, it's, it's a boy. 
And Isaiah prophesies this baby will be a leader of all leaders. Governments will be upon his shoulders. He will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, a prince of peace. It's more than a mother or father could ever dream and hope for their child. But in the book of Isaiah, we also read this prophecy in chapters 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And by his wounds, we are healed. This doesn't sound as sweet and fun. Pierced, crushed, punished wounded. The beauty of a Christmas prophecy just turned a quick corner to something unimaginable. A prophecy of not only death, but a, but a brutal death. I mean, surely this baby won't be asked to be put through such trials. Well, let's fast forward to the fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus is born and now it's time for a child dedication. And who doesn't love a child dedication? It's one of my favorite things to do here at Creekside. You see the wonder in the parents' eyes as they stand before the church with their pride and joy. Their daughter or son uh, nestled safely in their arms. They come to lift their child up before God and the church, dedicating themselves to raising up this child in the ways of God. It's a heartwarming moment. And Mary and Joseph get this moment in Luke chapter two. Chapter two, verse 22 to 35. Let's read it together here. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. You see, it had been revealed to Simeon that before he died, he would see Messiah. And here he was, the promised child who would, who would be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. Simeon had been waiting. All of Israel had been waiting and here he was. What a beautiful moment. Simeon even says, I can, I can die now. I have seen your peace, so, so bring me into your peace. But then in verse 33 and in the beginning of 34, we have this awe and wonder moment. It says, Mary and Joseph, the child's father and mother, marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. It's this peaceful, happy moment. And then Simeon turns that ugly corner. Here's the rest of the passage. And he said to Mary, his mother, The child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Isaiah and Simeon don't let us stay at the beauty of the birth for long before they lead us to the agony of Jesus' death on the cross. So let's go forward again now to Paul. Now we met Paul just as we uh, took a break in our Church Ignited series going through the book of Acts. And later in his ministry, he writes to the church of Colossae. Let's read Colossians chapter one, verses 15 through 20. It says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created 
things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Again, such a beautiful, wonderful passage, rightfully calling Jesus the full image of God, one with God. All things were created by him and through him. He is above all things and everything. He has supremacy. The fullness of God dwells in him for he is the very being of God here on earth. But Paul also quickly reminds us of that turned corner. Look again at verse 20. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself, God, Jesus, the fullness of God, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The wonder and beauty ends in death. Death isn't a thing we like to to think about. Child dedications are way more fun than funerals. Why couldn't this story end at this beautiful birth of Jesus? Why couldn't it end with with angels singing and, and peace on earth, goodwill to men? I want to point out a common theme in these passages, specifically the Isaiah and Colossians passage. Isaiah 53, five, it says the punishment that brought us peace was on him, was upon him. And then Colossians 19 and 20, for God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You see, peace may have come to earth at Christmas, but it came into us at the cross. Indeed, he came to bring us peace at Christmas. The angels weren't wrong when they sang in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace was indeed on earth. The fullness of the power of peace was right there in that child. Because the one who had created all things, the one who has all things under control, even when I feel out of control, had come to be like us. The one who brings significance to our lives when we feel small had come. The fullness of peace had come, but that peace was his, not ours. It had come so we could see it, so we could behold it, but it was not ours, not yet. Christmas, his birth, shows me that the God who controls the whole universe came to me, to us, so that he might be known, that he might reconcile all things to himself and bring us peace. But that peace was not found in a manger in a cave. That peace was found by his shed blood on the cross. Jesus Christ is born the Prince of Peace. He is the bringer of peace. But to give this peace, he must first give himself over to death on the cross so that he could conquer death and conquer sin for us so that we might believe and become living sacrifices for him. And in that sacrificial living, he becomes our peace. And in this new year, I want us to all find that peace. Because the peace of God, the peace in which the angels sing is not just an absence of war or or being free from internal strife. The biblical idea of peace is bigger, grander, and far more wonderful. The word for peace in Hebrew is shalom. In Arabic, it is salam. Shalom and salam are words used to both greet people and to bid them farewell. In the Middle East, when you say hello, you are greeting people in peace, asking them, are are you and your family and your affairs at peace? You're also granting them peace in your relationship with them. 
When you say goodbye, you are encouraging them to go at peace, praying that peace will envelop them and and reminding them that you and they are at peace. In fact, I wish we would incorporate it into our culture just to greet and say farewell by saying shalom. Because no matter how different we are, how, how different we think, shalom, salam, let there be peace between us. Now, shalom at its root means to be complete or to be made whole. It's something we become. When we move towards shalom, we, we move towards completeness, to wholeness, to well-being and harmony. It's more than just getting along with others. Jesus didn't come so we could be nice, so we could tolerate one another. He came to bring us completeness and wholeness to be fully united with God and others. And we had that peace once in the beginning. We were complete, whole with him. But then we lost this peace when sin entered into the world. But God went to great lengths to have a relationship with us and bring us back into shalom, into peace. And as I stated earlier, this peace comes to us through his sacrifice on the cross. And Jesus himself talks to his disciples as he's on the way to the cross, willing to give himself up for us. Look at this, read this with me in John chapter 14, starting in verse 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All of this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, Christ came to give us peace by leaving us his peace. Not as the world gives, It's not temporary. It's not just for a moment. It's more than just everyone getting along. Jesus offers something more, something bigger and greater. He is actually giving us his peace. He and the father are one and he is making us one with him and with the father. This is a complete reconciliation with our maker, God. And in verse 23, it says, he will make his home in us. Think about that. The God of the universe, the one who created the sun and moon and stars, the one who oversees time and space, cares about you so much that he wants to make your heart his home. He longs for you to be whole. He longs for you to be complete. This is why he reminds you that your life can be untroubled and why you don't have to be afraid because he leaves you with his peace. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. My peace, I'm not creating your peace. I'm sharing with you my peace. I am bringing you into my peace. And this doesn't happen at the manger. It happens at the cross. Back to Colossians 1.20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, all things, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. His blood shed on the cross gives to us that reconciliation and relationship again to our creator. We who were broken apart are now made whole, complete in a state of of shalom, peace with God, because he has given his peace to us. He who who conquered death and and the grave and, and in it all our sin gave us his peace. 
And after his resurrection in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says to his disciples, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. See, when Jesus told his friends that he had overcome the world, he was making something clear. The whole point of his coming at Christmas was to overcome all that is wrong in this fallen place. He stepped into our world, becoming one of us so we could see that he understood and felt and had lived in the mess too. He came into it so we would see that we didn't have to stay in that mess. He was given the name Jesus because he came to save, to save us from the world that is sometimes so hard to live in, so difficult to experience. He came to save us from from the worst of ourselves, our our basest of instincts, our, our worldly traits, our sinful fallen selves, all those things that make us feel like, like giving up and quitting. He saved us from all of that. And in this past year, there might have been a lot in your life that made you feel like giving up and quitting. But Jesus comes and he brings peace. I'm reminded of a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Around Christmas in 1863, Longfellow felt like giving up and quitting. His wife of nearly 20 years had died in a tragic fire. His country was raged by war, unrest, and political division at the height of the Civil War. He had received word that his oldest son had been severely wounded at the Battle of New Hope Church. And as Christmas was coming that year in 1863, Longfellow didn't have much peace, hope, and love in his heart. Overwhelmed, burdened, and and broken, the poet sat down and wrote a poem called Christmas Bells. I want to read it to you. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. His very name, Emmanuel, means God with us. Wherever you are, whatever is happening in your life, he is there and he promises that wrong will fail. Sin and death and destruction, all that is wrong with the world will not win. The fullness of God chose to be obedient to death on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. The wrong have failed. The right will prevail with peace Peace given to us by a sacrifice on a cross. See, Christmas is now behind us, but the sacrifice that baby grew to become remains. The peace, love, joy, and hope that was brought to us at Christmas doesn't come around once a year. 
It came not only to dwell with us, but to dwell in us. God's whole plan was to come in a manger, but journey to a cross, to die for us and to overcome death and the grave for our victory. And so we look upon this empty cross and know that by the forgiveness of our sins, the peace, light, and joy of Christmas comes to dwell in our hearts. Our hearts become Christ's home. It's a mess. I know. But yet he says, here I am. I'm standing, knocking. Please let me in. So let's open up our hearts, open our homes to let the glory of God, the peace of God come and dwell in us. And may we open our hearts to others so that they too can come and know the peace of God. So right now, let's turn our attention to the sacrifice of God by remembering him, celebrating him by taking communion. Jesus takes his disciples into the upper room. Jesus is explaining to them that there will be agony. They will be scattered. There will be betrayal. Hard times will come. Hard times will even stay for a long time. But in a strange way, the way of the cross, he will overcome the world and bring peace that can dwell in our hearts. And how fitting is it that we start this new year remembering his sacrifice, which brings us his peace brings us his life, his love, his joy, his hope. So if you have some bread and juice, I I encourage you to gather them now. You can pause the video right here if you like and come back. For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so my prayer for you is let us proclaim the Lord's death because in his death, we are filled with peace. So may you be filled with evidence everywhere that the one who came to us at Christmas is still here. He is not absent. He is not gone. He is not dead, nor doth he sleep. And in this year, may we find his peace, his light in all dark places. I want to leave you with this passage that Paul writes in Philippians chapter four. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So do not be anxious about in everything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace, Lord, bring us back to your peace. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail No, my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle we fall to you, Lord 
glad you joined us here at Creekside Online. I want to give you a blessing. On the count of three, let's put our hands together. Ready? One, two, three. 
In this new year, may you find the peace of God that he has given you. Pack that up, put it in your heart, and have a wonderful day.